Hello, I'm Dominic Cobson. My guest today is Rosario Ingargiola, founder and CEO of Basonic, a San Francisco-based company which has adapted cryptocurrency techniques and technologies to provide users at FX Prime Brokerage Services with an alternative to, well, using the balance sheet and credit of a prime broker. Rosario, thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me, Dominic. Now, currency trading, uh, even by this new breed of, of non-bank liquidity providers we've heard so much about, like Jump and XTX, is still ultimately dependent on bank credit. So what can the traditional uh, FX market participants learn from cryptocurrency trading techniques and technologies? Yeah, it's, a, it's an interesting question. I mean, I think um, obviously nobody, nobody in the FX markets uh, really wants to uh, take credit risk. And, and there are folks that specialize in pricing that risk, such as the prime brokers that provide the credit to allow these counterparties to face each other. Um, what's interesting about the crypto space is that it actually, um, there, there's a lot more willingness to accept credit risk. And uh, a big part of that, you know, has to do with, you know, people sort of making hay while the sun shines, you know, they're, they're, they're willing to take credit risk to people. They're making a lot of money. Spreads are wide. It's kind of a different animal. Um, I do think it's going to get regulated uh, away, at least to some large degree, because right now it, it seems to be, uh, you know, pretty, pretty rampant. Pretty much all of the dealers don't want to post collateral. They're all taking credit risk and giving bilateral credit lines to different counterparties. Even the way some of the, the, the big banks are looking at solving, giving, uh, as they roll out digital asset custody solutions, they're, they're looking at giving people access to liquidity on exchanges and so forth, uh, really ultimately through some sort of a credit arrangement. And, uh, and so I think, you know, there's, there's ways to mitigate that risk. And, uh, and I think that's what we're trying to solve, you know, here at Basonic. Mm -hmm. So to some extent, it sounds like the, uh, like the crypto markets could learn more from the, the prime brokerage markets and vice versa at this point. But I, I saw in a, a, a webinar on Prime Brokerage recently, Tom Jessup of Fidelity describing atomic settlement, by which I understand that one asset moves only if the transfer of the other asset also occurs. Uh, Tom described atomic settlement of that kind as the North Star of capital markets. And if I've understood your model correctly, the Basonic model, currencies are exchanged atomically, they're settled in real time. And that uh, presumably does dispense with the need for credit intermediation that uh, that, that bedevils prime brokerage today and which you've, which is absent from the, the crypto markets you've just been uh, describing. In other words, the exchange is gonna be synchronized and settled in real time. So we don't need a, a bank balance sheet. Uh, is that an accurate description of, 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 of the Basonic model? Yeah, that's, that's right. I mean, what we're providing is really a technology equivalent of that credit intermediation function where we're not a counterparty to the trades and we're not relying on our own balance sheet. And uh, an atomic exchange of assets basically just means atomic is really a computer science term that means as a single concurrent unit. So it, what it means is that the two assets change hands concurrently uh, in real time on a blockchain ledger. Um, and that gets rid of that sort of who goes first problem. So if you think about you know, one of the key functions of CLS Bank, besides all the netting of the trades down, um, ultimately, at the end of the day, they're swapping those net settlement amounts due on behalf of the parties where the parties don't have to worry about that Herstat risk or, or that, that you know, they, they delivered to one party and didn't receive uh, payments that were coming to them in the other direction. And so, uh, you know, that is possible to achieve with pure technology. Now, if assets are going to be exchanged concurrently, the asset has to be in the account. Does that mean that your account always has to be fully funded in the Basonic model. So, so that's the baseline of, of, of course, right? And, and, and ultimately you have to support the whole spectrum of trading all the way to fully on credit and everything in between with margin and so forth. Um, and, and I suspect we'll talk a little bit about, about how we're approaching that, but, but yes, you do. The baseline of this is, is not only the accounts fully funded, but it's, it's, really, it's really a real-time collateral management exercise, right? So it's more than having a, the reason for using blockchain technology is because you're trying to go further than you can go with just a legal agreement and a promise to pay. And so it's not just about having the assets in the account. It's also about having those assets tokenized onto uh, enterprise permission blockchain ledger, 
where when they're in that form, they're then freely tradable and transferable and ownership, in other words, can be transacted literally in real time on chain as part of uh, a trade execution. And so that's really the, the bosonic model. And then of course, with that blockchain based underpinning, you can then layer on uh, a whole bunch of other services that, that do things like use those same capabilities to let people tap into uh, other people's balance sheet in a frictionless way, such that you can support uh, various forms of, of people trading on credit and lots of asymmetry around credit, funded margin, you know, and so forth. Mm -hmm. Well, you, you refer to tapping into other people's balance sheets. Now, if, if an asset is tokenized onto the blockchain, that asset's got to be in, in that off-chain account, I suppose. Uh, and if not everybody's going to find it easy to, to make sure that it is there, they're going to need credit, as you say. So tell us a bit more about where people in the Bosonic model are going to raise that credit from or are raising that credit from. And, uh, and I think you hinted at this, that, that credit is going to have to be collateralized as well. So who do they collateralize it with? How do they mobilize it? How do they move it between, uh, between accounts? Is it, a, is it a pledge model or is it something else? Yeah, no, very, very good questions, multifaceted questions here. But what's interesting is, is if you look at um, sort of the, you know, the, the, even the FX world and the prime, the prime brokerage market and look at recent solutions like Capitolis and things like that, there are clearly lots of people that know how to price the risks, but that sort of prime brokerage model is a very closed system. So it's very hard for other people to come in and price that risk, uh, you know, within that within the confines of a client relationship between a client and their prime broker. Um, what's unique about our model is that it's a multi-custodial model. So anybody that's licensed to hold client assets, whether it's a trust company, a bank, a brokerage, an, FCA, uh, an FCM, they can all participate and use our solution to take client assets that they're holding and tokenize those assets very easily uh, onto blockchain ledgers within the node using the software that we provide to them. What that um, then allows for is the ability to do things with that collateral in real time where you actually have uh, the ability to ha have real time change of uh, um, ownership of title, right? So you can have things like settlement finality when you do an atomic swap of, of two assets, whether that's dollars for Bitcoin or dollars for euros, doesn't much matter. But the beauty of that model is that you can have parties that know how to price those risks hold collateral that they may in, in, in whatever form, it could be treasuries, it could be uh, dollars, it could be a portfolio of, of, of whatever assets. Um, those assets can stay wherever they already exist at a custodial entity. They can be tokenized onto a blockchain ledger. They can then be made available for lend within a model like this without actually moving the assets anywhere. And so they could then pledge those assets, in, in other words, make those assets available for lend, have very simple workflow tools around setting their interest rate and all the risk parameters like initial variation liquidation margin levels. Uh, and then anybody that is on the network that has assets on, uh, uh, um, you know, at a custodian on the network, or if, if, uh, if, if, it's, if, it's, if there's some sort of a bilateral credit understanding between these parties, that collateral can then be essentially borrowed intraday elastically on demand as a repo transaction that happens on those custodial blockchain ledgers. And so what that gives you the ability to do is essentially with very, very little friction, allow anybody that knows how to price the risks to come in and make collateral available to provide things like leverage and other sorts of uh, you know, intraday trade financing to these different counterparties. So you can imagine a scenario where somebody like a big dealer wants to trade on credit. They don't, the reason the reason they don't want they want to trade on credit is obvious. They don't want to put up balance sheet and have the cost of capital of having that balance sheet committed, right? But they might be a substantial firm. They may choose to trade with other parties on the network where those parties are fully funded, or maybe they're on margin, and that margin is protecting their P and L with a much within a much bigger credit limit. Um, and they might want to trade with other counterparties as these institutions come into the market now. A lot of them are not interested in credit risk uh, of any kind, and they may require trading with that dealer on a fully funded basis. And under this model, that dealer can actually borrow in those assets intraday with a repo to effectively uh, be fully funded as they face those other counterparties 
but at the same time, um, shift that risk to the party that was willing to price them, you know, and, and, and those parties are obviously seeking a yield and getting compensated accordingly. But that's the idea uh, behind the model is to take that sort of base layer uh, blockchain capability that's multi-custodial and cross-custodian capable and allow people to leverage it to get the rest of the prime services like lending. What you're really describing is a, is a system in which by tokenizing assets onto the blockchain, you get around the problem of actually having to, in effect, physically move uh, the, the asset from the person who is, is borrowing to the person who's lending. Uh, and that is going to be a lot more efficient. But are there further efficiencies to be squeezed out of that? Can, you, can these traders uh, not just mobilize capital wherever it's in custody with somebody, but economize on it through portfolio margining? or margin offsets or, or cross margining? Is that built into your model, those sort of collateral savings mechanisms? Yeah, yeah, hundred percent. I mean, I mean the whole, the whole idea behind this and, and it's complicated, right? Because you have, you have one of the, one of the things that we've built is actually a cross custodian net settlement capability. So ultimately as parties withdraw assets or parties want to bring assets back to their home custodian, there is a need to take the netted quantities uh, the residuals, the, the quantities that are remaining, and potentially move those between different custodial entities depends on the depends on the nature of the asset and the nature of the you know whether it's a client that's just lending their portfolio of treasuries or or a pool of dollars or if it's somebody that's actively trading and needs to do other things with those assets and so on. And so that cross custodian net settlement capability is kind of the holy grail of all of this that would allow two custodians to actually do a net settlement transaction with each other atomically so that they don't have any risk to each other. And the, the netted portion uh, gets burned and reallocated on the custodial blockchain ledgers. The residual quantities would go over traditional payment rails ultimately you know, in phase two of this when, when everything is more fully digitized, you can use smart contracts to actually move the residual quantities and have one truly atomic transaction. That, you know, until that rolls out, um, you know, it's, it's hard to uh, get around AML KYC considerations around transacting cross custodian, where you end up owning assets on a ledger of a custodian that doesn't know you as a client. It's just not, it's not feasible to do one, one off redemptions for further credit to, to the client. And so, um, so that's why we built that cross custodian net settlement capability. But the whole system um, by design is already cross custodian trading capable. So what that means is, is I can go long with a with one counterparty at custodian A, short with another counterparty at custodian B. Those counterparties can be dealers, they can be exchangers, they can be you know whatever type of counterparty. I'm flat, and all of that is happening you know in real time on chain, multilaterally, right? So that gives you a tremendous capital efficiency that's basically impossible to achieve today in the current uh, digital asset space. And, and sometimes it's hard to achieve even in the traditional markets. Now, netting, which you've just been referring to is, is clearly hugely important. One of the regular criticisms of, of, of blockchain as a, as a trading model has been that you lose the benefits of netting. And they are substantial in, in the FX market. In particular, if we look at, at CLS, it nets down six trillion plus a day to a tenth, uh, a hundredth of that. In fact, it's like 60 billion. That's obviously worth huge amounts to to the banks that, that, that dominate those, those markets. So can we, can we just stay with netting for a while? And because it sounds counterintuitive that you can settle atomically, but also preserve the benefits of netting. Walk me through more slowly how your model preserves the benefits of, of netting. Sure, well, well, what's really happening when you do an atomic swap or an atomic exchange of assets on those custodial ledgers is you really are just changing the ownership of the underlying in real time at the time of trade execution on those custodial blockchain ledgers. So another way to think about it is to think about this, that, that the blockchain ledgers are really an alternate ledger system that's essentially licensed to these custodians. So assets are locked down in the legacy system, whether that's a digital asset wallet or a banking or trust system that's holding US dollars or other fiat. Uh, they're tokenized onto these custodial blockchain ledgers. Those custodial blockchain ledgers become the golden source of truth in terms of the ownership and settlement finality and, and so on, right? And you can, you can obviously get into you know, all sorts of debates about what settlement finality means. But 
from a practical point of view, it, it, it ownership at a regulated entity of an asset, it should generally be deemed to be settlement finality. And, and so uh, because of that, you can, you don't actually have to move the underlying in order to actually um, deal with the netting. You don't have to actually deliver an asset anywhere in order to get the benefits of netting all of the trades down. And so what the solution that we give to our custodians actually does continuous netting in real time in the background. They have a few different ways to interact with that. They have a report that they can pull at any point in time that will show them the net settlement amounts due between every counterparty uh, on the network that's within that custodian and ultimately other custodians if they're trading, <clears throat> if cross custodian trading is enabled. And, uh, and then they can then do those net settlement movements periodically based on client withdrawals or other client needs or their SLA with their clients. Um, but in general, nothing has to actually move. They can also take those uh, net settlement movements through, through an API and through sort of a flat file uh, export mechanism that we have. So we're supporting kind of the whole range of capabilities that these custodians uh, might have in terms of what they can do technologically on their side in terms of actually moving the assets. But the point is, is that uh, you can actually do all of this netting in real time on chain, which is reflected across everybody on the network's balances as they transact with each other in real time. And so that's that's basically what we're doing. And, and there's a lot that goes into that, right? I mean, we've we've had to even build a, you know, a complete blockchain stack that's a multi-ledger architecture just to give us that level of transaction scalability and throughput. Um, you know, because you can't do this with a single ledger architecture. So I think part of the part of where people get hung up is 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 just not uh, not sort of thinking outside the box and thinking outside of a single ledger model. And so it become it feels like there's a big barrier in terms of doing you know real time capital markets trading use cases. But we've we've worked around that by actually just designing our own technology. Just one one last question, which is which is prompted by what you've just said. Uh, there seem to be quite a few straws in, in, in the wind. I referred to that comment by Mike Jessup at Fidelity. Uh, I noticed the other day a transaction in which the Onyx Group at JP Morgan was involved with Goldman and, uh, and BNY Mellon in the, in the repo sector. Uh, you yourselves have just announced uh, something with, with, with the Crosstower Digital Asset Exchange. And the problem you alluded to a second ago about uh, thinking outside the box and trying to get away from this single ledger idea do you feel now that you're no longer a, a lonely pioneer, but actually you're now pushing at an open door with this approach to capital markets trading? And can we look forward to this being extended from currencies to securities? Yeah, I mean, I, I felt five years ago when I started the company, and this was a very long, deep technology build out, right? It took four and a half years to build this technology stack. I, I kind of envisioned this right from the outset. I mean, this is, we've never pivoted. This has been exactly what we've been trying to achieve. And it was kind of born out of necessity because when I, when I left um, my last firm, um, you know, we were in the FX space and, and we were, you know, uh, doing aggregation and everything was driven by prime broker credit, looked at doing something similar in the digital asset space, realized there's no such thing as prime brokerage, was learning about blockchain, uh, and other technologies that are adjacent to that and realize that you can actually create a solution to kind of provide this alternative to the to credit intermediation, which ultimately is described as this sort of, you know, real-time clearing and settlement or real-time atomic exchange of assets on these, these blockchain ledgers. And, and so, you know, I, I think that the truth is, is that a lot of any, all of the folks that are exploring digital assets, um, and whether that's digitizing existing traditional market asset classes or looking at the digital assets space and the cryptocurrency space, I think everybody understands intuitively like what, what Tom Jessup said, that that is really sort of the, the North Star, or the Holy Grail of where we're trying to get to because it, because it changes everything in terms of all of the cost structure around collateral management, um, all, of, all of those overheads. It just, it, 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 it obviously would free up a lot of capital and bring a lot of efficiency and reduce a lot of cost. And, and so I think uh, there's a lot of people trying to solve the problem. And it's actually very exciting to see announcements like, like what JP Morgan announced. Um, you know, I, I suspect that it's a very similar approach that they're, uh, that they're, that they're pursuing uh, to what we've done here at Masonic. 
you know, we've, you know, we, we were also live and in production and we went meaningfully live uh, probably mid September of this year. We've cleared and settled well over $2 billion on the platform uh, since then and are kind of just getting started. So, you know, it's, it's, it's more than a theory. It works. JP Morgan just proved it works in the, in that repo context. Um, and uh, I think there's lots of exciting things coming and I think it will ultimately, I think what's the thing that stands out to me the most is that I feel like there's going to be a convergence around turning traditional assets into natively digital assets that transact in this way a lot faster than people think. I think that with the developments that with central bank digital currencies, with initiatives like what JP Morgan just announced there with Onyx, I think that we're getting to that point a lot sooner than than people think. I don't think it's a ten year thing. I think it's a I think it's a three year thing. Is is my guess? Exciting thought to end on. Thank you, Rosario Ingagiola. Thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me, Dominic. Thank you.